Thank you very much, President Thomas. I was originally elected in 2004, and the first year I came down here, I, I used to come to these meetings religiously because I knew there was so much for me to learn, and one of the most exciting things about being in the state legislature is the opportunity to learn more about all different parts of the state and communities that I was unfamiliar with. So it was very important to me. That's why I originally started coming, and then I kept coming for the food. So, <laughs> and uh, But in later years, I got just really busy and haven't been here for a long time, so it's really... I'm really glad to be back here. And right now I'm serving on two committees that um, sort of lend themselves to discussion. One of them is the TAPS Throughput Committee, which is currently looking at the governor's um, oil tax bill. But I decided I'm going to talk about the thing that's actually nearer and dearer to my heart, and that is the Education Committee. And I hope that works for you guys, although education is inextricably tied up with education funding issues, and those are kind of dry, so I'll try not to be too dry and talk about what we really want um, with education. Now, the governor said he has a goal of 90, I don't know if it was the governor, um, certainly the Anchorage School District, has a goal of 90% graduation rate by 2020. I think that's laudable, and I hope that we can all support that, get behind it, and look for both policy changes and, um, and funding questions about that. Um, and another thing that I think is really important to, to lead us forward to, toward that goal is to use the Common Core Standards. My school district, it, although the state hasn't formally adopted Common Core Standards, my school district, the Anchorage School District has, and I think many districts are going with them. And what that means is that um, there will be a formal determination, which we have a lot in place already, about what concepts, what levels in every field that students across the state should be doing. So, for example, a third grader will be expected to have a certain reading ability and master a given vocabulary, which will tie in also with what they're doing in math and what concepts they should know in math and social studies and so on. And I think it's really important, particularly in a state like Alaska, that we share that understanding because we have so much mobility and we have people People that move multiple times over the years. They move back and forth from a bush community to the city, or they might just move around to different neighborhoods, changing schools. And so when a child moves in the middle of third grade, where the arriving school is working on the same things that the, the original school was, and that will help kids kind of stay on track and not have to spend time catching up or shifting gears. That's important. One of the other goals we have is the Alaska Performance Scholarship, which is a merit scholarship program. And I, I like to talk about this program and because I want people to understand that it is not about college scholarships at all. It's about changing the culture of schools so that students choose academic rigor and schools are um, who aren't already offering the science and math classes and things that are needed for students to be eligible for the performance scholarship will do so and will be pushed to do so by families and such if it's not, not, not available so families can say why is it my student cannot get the courses that they need in order to qualify for this scholarship program. So it's I think a really um, good tool for us to use um, and, and, in, and just so people know, it's not just for academic scholarships, but also for vocational education and certification. Um, and we have the preliminary results for the first um, year or two of the scholarship, and we find out that rural Alaska is not doing um, as well in terms of having a percentage of students who qualify for the scholarship. Um, that is a, a cause for concern, and during the debate about it, we always had a concern, well, what, what, uh, that might be fine in Anchorage and Juneau and Fairbanks, but what happens in small communities? And the school districts, you know, were pretty much unanimous that they would be able to provide it. Um, I don't know yet if that's really happening. Um, I know that communications across Alaska have been greatly enhanced in many places by GCI's efforts. So um, there, there may be work yet to do there, but that is a laudable goal. So um, how do we uh, support uh, all of these goals in, in other ways? And um, it is my view that it's critically important that we provide the resources that are necessary for our, all of our students to do as well as they can and go as far as they can and to encourage them to do that in all areas. Um, 
I think that we're missing the boat thus far. We have flat funded education we, for four years now. Um, we saw a, a trend over time for, there was a period when we were forward funding education and we were inflation proofing it and we haven't done that for four years and we're beginning to see the fruits of that. I don't know what is happening in Juneau, but in Anchorage uh, there was an announcement just a couple weeks ago about losing 215 support staff, largely support staff, but they were support staff like special education aides, they were the graduation aides and mentors and counselors to help the kids who were at risk of not finishing school, not going to school. So um, that, that's a big uh, red flag that we're moving in the wrong way. Um, so it is our constitutional obligation to fund schools and I think it's our moral obligation to invest whatever is needed and people say, well, how much money do schools need? I say it's completely the wrong question. What, does, what are the results we want and what does it take to get those results? And that's what we should be doing and that is our obligation. Um, so forward funding, that, that's common sense. Businesses forward fund, they plan ahead, they know what their goals are for three years out, what they need to have, and we should be doing the same for schools, for school districts, so that they can um, provide continuity in, in their programs, in their teaching staff, in their faculty, uh, because it's, it's very traumatic for um, teachers to get pink slips because things haven't been funded um, timely for them, and they start to look elsewhere. Okay, let's see. Um, there is talk about making changes to the performance scholarships to allow more flexibility in classes and I am not in favor of that at all because as I said it's not about giving kids scholarships so much as encouraging students to reach, to reach as high as they can and to encouraging school districts to make sure that they provide what's needed for the students who will reach forward and if you water down the standards you do a disservice and you um, eliminate the real goal of this, of this legislation. Um, let's see, there's been a lot of talk about cultural sensitivity programs in our schools and I don't have a lot of first-hand knowledge about that directly but we are a diverse state and any time we have to bring teachers in from outside that's troubling and the lot we've heard about that in, in all kinds of fields when you hire people from outside they come for a little while and have a, a wonderful Alaskan um, experience but sometimes they don't stay you know they start to have their own children or their parents need them or whatever and they leave the state and so in all areas we want to grow our own we've, we've worked on doing that for um, allied medical fields for nursing um, for teachers and um, we need to continue doing that another big area and it's a topic of discussion today in the Senate Education Committee is that of uh, completing the funding for the new engineering buildings at the University of Alaska in Anchorage and Fairbanks. Um, Senator Ellis has talked about, he's the sponsor of the bill, and he's talked about the fact that across this state we need to have about 50 new engineers minimum of, of all different kinds of engineers just to keep up with growing need and in addition we anticipate we have a graying workforce that about 70 a year will retire and that's 120 new engineers are needed in this state right now and uh, every year and we're crammed to the gills in our engineering facilities. We started funding the schools. We gave them about uh, half of what they need and we want to reach the other half to keep that programs, those programs going forward. And that's engineers in, in mining and petroleum and civil engineering and mechanical engineering, all of that. Um, and speaking of engineering programs, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program, um, known as ANSEP. And those folks originally had a vision that they wanted to, um, first of all, include, increase the literacy of students in, in mathematics, engineering, and science technology. Um, and they wanted to do that, to focus on doing that in rural Alaska, in the bush, and they started at ninth grade level and they said, they, they said to kids, if you will provide materials and if you build your own computer, you get to keep it as long as you stay in school. If you drop out of school, we come back and take the computer away from you. And the kids had to do it themselves, work, working in teams, and nobody told them, here's the template, build your computer. But if they stayed in school, they were encouraged to, to go to college. And when they got to college, they um, had 
a lot of uh, wraparound services. They have dorms where they slept together, they worked in teams, they had support to keep kids in school. And it has been phenomenally successful. And over the years, they've kind of um, expanded it. They realized starting in ninth grade to get kids thinking about going to college or uh, being an engineer is too late. You need to start earlier. And they started going to the seventh and eighth grade, and recently they're reaching down into the sixth grade. And the model is so effective. The graduation rates and the, the things that they're achieving with these kids is, is just um, a wonderful model for all of us. And I think that uh, we need to make sure that we provide resources so that this can be happening in schools all over the state um, for not just science and mathematics and engineering, but that, that kids that kids begin to see that they have the chance to go further to do maybe more than other people in their family have done. I mean, it's very exciting when kids can see that even though they don't know anybody who went to college or they don't know anybody who um, did these programs, that they themselves actually have a path and can be a model for other kids. And we're seeing that now. So um, I think key for today is to make sure we understand what it takes to get the outcomes that we want, how do we continue to move forward to make sure that we can get as many kids as possible through school and on into career track, um, whether they choose to be um, academic or vocational education. And what does it take? It starts with making sure that we invest the resources today so that our big resource, our children, can maximize their um, abilities and their futures and be able to stay here in Alaska and raise their children. So, any questions? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Berta. Um, we're going to take one uh, second. Uh, it, it's part of our tradition to pay tribute to our, our founders through the Alaska Native Sisterhood and Alaska Native Brotherhood. So I've asked Brad to go ahead and take a few moments to introduce our grand camp officers and uh, executive committee members that are here. Uh, thank you, President Thomas. Uh, today we have from the a and Executive Committee, Brother Alvin Kenley. And from the ANS Executive Committee, we have Sister Selena Everson. <laughs> Sister Ethel Lund. <laughs> and the Grand Secretary, Peter Narrows. <laughs> and the newly elected ANS Camp 70 President, Jan Trigg. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Paul. As part of the Elizabeth Pradovich Day celebration, the State uh, Museum exhibits will be open all day on February 16, and they have a special Elizabeth Pradovich display. So please take time uh, and go and stop by, and, uh, and it's free of charge, I understand. Okay, we're going to go on to our next speaker, uh, uh, Chris Tuck. His, uh, Profile is in your program, and uh, once he is done, then we'll go into a question and answers. Thank you, President Thomas. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, good to see everybody coming together to learn and understand you and 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 understand the issues that face our um, our state, our communities, and our neighborhoods. Um, I, um, by trade, am an electrician. And I got involved in my labor organization because I had a passion and a determination to see people do better. And through that, I became a union organizer. And as a union organizer, I have developed some skills to be able to bring people of diverse backgrounds, of different uh, political beliefs, different religious beliefs, um, different age, different gender, all coming together for one purpose, and that is to make their lives better. And in my passion to do that, I decided to run for political office. 
And one of the sad things that I see when I go out door knocking is to learn that neighbors have been living close by one another but never got a chance to meet one another. I feel that there's a disconnect that's happening in our communities and it kind of saddens me. And one of my goals is, is to make sure that we have that sense of community happening once again. Now, what attracts me to the native cultures is that there is a strong sense of community that exists and lives within everyone. I mean, after all, just to survive, we've all got to stick together. And my mom was raised in Antioch, Alaska, and then uh, she married my, I mean, she didn't marry my dad, she chased my dad down to California, ended up pregnant with me, and then we moved back up to Alaska when I was five, and then my first year in Alaska was in Tanana. And uh, so I have a lot of Athabascan cousins, a lot of uh, Aleut cousins. I do have one white boy cousin down in Idaho. Um, but my family, and I have no native in me, but my family has a lot of um, um, native heritage within us. And uh, I had the privilege this last year, not last year, but the summer before, of uh, going down the Yukon River from um, Eagle all the way down to uh, Tanana. And that's where my family, a lot of my family lives now. I don't know if you guys have been watching the uh, Yukon Men show. That's my uncles, my aunts, my cousins. That's all, that's all my family right there. Uh, and so when I look at how people are sticking together to survive, I mean, where, where, where have we transitioned to where we no longer have that attitude, where we're more about me, myself, and individualism and not caring about who our neighbors are? And so I have to think really deep about that. And why do people like small towns? It's because that hometown feeling is still there. And, you know, living in the big city of Anchorage, that is my goal. And you guys are the example of how to try to bring that hometown feeling right there. So this subject of community has really been on my mind quite a bit. And um, these thoughts aren't really all together there but I'm still reaching out to try to, um, try to put it all together. When, um, when, again, going back to door knocking, one of the things I see is that people are losing hope and, uh, and people are being disconnected. And so one of the things that I think we need to do as organizations, whether it's a labor organization, a tribal council, a native corporation, uh, we need to be able to empower people. And the best way that we empower people is to educate them, and that motivates them. And so um, my good friend, um, Mike Coombe, who's on my staff, introduced a book to me called Raising Expectations. And the whole thing is just, just that. How do you mobilize people? How do you take advantage of those moments in history or those moments in time where People are willing to drop everything. Forget about dinner. Forget about um, taking their kids to a soccer game. Forget about uh, paying their electric bill and band together and take action. And I think a lot of that is, is just giving people hope, giving them a vision, giving them um, higher expectations of what to expect in their workplace, what to expect in their community, how they're going to be treated when they get older, how their children's education and how we're going to provide for our children, and uh, even going down to better expectations of our neighborhoods, our government, and uh, our organizations. And I think that that's, that's one of the key things that we need to do, is we need to, if you really want to have true individualism, we've got to stick together first. And I feel that there's a sense in the air that people are wondering what is going on, what is wrong. Um, we've seen some of these uprisings happen even nationwide. You know, recently we had the Tea Party movement that got banned together because people were upset with the banking industry bailouts. And then they were quickly taken over by the heavily funded organizations and they kind of transitioned. And then we hear, we see what happened with um, Occupy Wall Street again. People are willing to drop whatever, grab a rally sign, and get together. 
And they didn't have, have any headship because I think they were concerned about being taken over just like the Tea Party movement once was. And I think it's one and the same. But people are feeling a sense of something's wrong in this nation. And I think that we need to have more dialogue. We need to talk. We need to get together more often. And so what I want to say is I appreciate forums like this. It's because you guys are doing exactly that. And it gives me hope and it gives me faith on what we can actually become and who we really should be. So with that, I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to be able to speak in front of you here today. We're going to uh, move right, right into question and answers, and we'll bring the microphones into the middle of the room so that if you want to uh, make some comments, then you'll uh, have the microphone so that everybody can hear the question. Uh, and I want to assure our speakers and other people from the legislature that even though our questions may be pointed, we are very pleased to be working with you. And, you know, uh, Chris, your comments are on target for what uh, this is all about. Uh, just to get started, I want you to know that with all of the needs in our state, particularly rural communities, I really do struggle with corporate welfare to oil companies. I just don't think that we can afford it, number one, and I think that since they already have such big profit margins. There really is a lot more incentive for them to go out there and uh, drill for oil as it is without having to have a tax break. Uh, the other thing that happened is the House of Representatives voted uh, uh, for House Bill or House Resolution or the House Bill uh, 80 uh, and really did not discuss with us who uh, worked on this uh, during the late 80s and early 90s uh, and uh, was finally passed in the mid-90s, uh, that uh, bill that on cruise ship dumping. Uh, and what I told our, our crew is that uh, after this bill passes, in two years then we're going to uh, make some clam chowder in the tour, dig some clams up from where the tour ships pass and dump their crap. And then we're going to feed that to our governor and our legislature, and we'll have a big feed for clams and mussels. And, oh, we're going to have fun. I won't eat any, but we're going to have them. Go ahead and eat it all up. After we pollute, the water's pretty good. <laughs> but that's our lifeblood in the southeast Alaska. We're, we're water people, and we just can't take chances that maybe the science isn't quite what they say it is. Uh, it's right on that line, and I, I know I can go out and find uh, some scientists that will totally uh, dis discount what the, the, the current science panel, panel said. You can find those folks. Uh, it's just a matter of being practical, and that's what I'm talking about. And uh, so, anyway, that's just to get started. Uh, <clears throat> and and I need to let you know that a lot of this is my own opinion, but uh, we have... Uh, resolutions that support what I'm talking about uh, from our, our tribal delegates and so uh, I, I would like to see if we can't have open dialogue on, uh, on, on some of these topics. Thanks. And on that theme, on uh, President Thomas's theme, I just want to add that the um, Speaker of the House, when asked whether there would be any discussion about coastal zone management, said, well, the voters have spoken, that's a no. Um, and I would s offer to him that the voters also spoke on the cruise ship initiative, and it piece by piece has been eaten away, and now the last piece of it's really gone. So uh, that was a little disturbing. I think voters should be worried about that. So, any questions? Uh, well, my name is Brad Plazenik, and I'd like to uh, uh, apologize, but I missed someone. And uh, ANS Camp 2 President Janet Dick is also with us. But as you can tell, she's hiding from me behind her. Hair. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, my question regards to the 90% uh, by 2020. Um, from a public policy standpoint, that sounds like we are planning to fail 10%. <laughs> and my concern is, is that that 10% you're gonna, you plan to fail are mainly gonna be native and rural students. So how come we don't have a policy to get 100%? I may have misspoken. I mean, obviously we'd like every child to achieve their maximum potential. And, but we're now, we were at 60%, I don't know exactly what we are, 70% now graduation rate. We've made progress and it's just saying within the next seven years we want to increase another, t another 20%. That's a big goal. It doesn't mean we quit there and say, okay, we're there, we're home. Um, we, we absolutely want to make sure that every student does the best they can, has the resources they need, teachers who are well qualified, who know them, who know their communities, who are, are gonna stay there and, and work with these kids, and that's how you get results. And if I may, if I'd like, I'd like to add that, um, you know, our schools are showing success, and we gotta make sure that we have the resources for them to show further success. But when school boards are looking at how to make cuts versus what we should do to make us Turn, make us a better education system for the 21st century, I think we're doing a disservice to them. Um, I'm really proud to say that in rural Alaska, um, we have Rural Cap that uh, has the Parents as Teachers program. We finally got that passed uh, through legislation last year to be able to have that opportunity for all Alaskans. We just gotta make sure that we have the funding there for that now that we have that going. And basically what that does is that is a, is a cost-effective pre-K program, a voluntary pre-K program, and instead of, of uh, teachers educating the students from zero to five years of age, we have uh, parent educators empowering parents and teaching them on the developmental stages of the human mind from zero to five years of age and how you take advantage of those learning opportunities. It was interesting to learn that age three is the best age to introduce a second language for you out there that want to hang on to your, your languages and your cultures, make sure you start teaching your children and your grandchildren early. Can I follow up with that? I mean, it, it just tells me, though, that for the next seven years, we are going to fail somewhere between 40% or less of the students. Does the state know how to educate our youth or not? And because I know there's a build up on the Hill about vouchers. And if your plan is to fail, this many of our students over the next seven years, doing better, yes, but you're still gonna to plan to fail this many students, and you can't say we know how to do it, then maybe it's time to let the private sector to educate our kids. And how would you respond to that voucher program? I would say, first of all, there's never been a plan, nobody has a plan to fail a single child. That is never the goal. Um, but we do know some things that will improve stuff for all kids. And when you make it better for one child in a classroom, it's better for everybody. The child is successful, more of a leader, they don't have behavior problems, all of those things, there are ripples all the way through. We know there's a great deal of data that preschool programs improve outcomes for kids. Um, uh, in a host of ways. That's one thing that we should do, and Chris has really been a leader on doing that. We know that class size has an impact, but there are also a lot of non-traditional um, things that we could look at, flipping classrooms, where instead of kids getting the lectures um, at school and doing their homework at home where there's not help, the kids could um, look at a YouTube video that's basically the, the core of a, of a lecture, and at school they're doing their work with other kids and with the teacher's assistants. That is happening in a few classrooms and, and across the nation, and I believe some in, Anchor, in, in Alaska, um, but there are innovative ways. We need to use technology much more than we do. And things like smart boards that let kids get immediate feedback where we can use them and that lets the teachers really pinpoint in, in almost immediate time where kids are lagging and where kids need support and where they're excelling and can go further ahead. So nobody is talking about, um, about letting any kids fail. We, we want to capture every kid, and particularly in Alaska, we're a small state and we, don't, we can't afford any throwaway kids. So, you know, the goal is to do the best you can for every single child. 
and, and I don't support school vouchers. Um, I mean, I don't support the constitutional um, amendment to allow it. Um, I am, unlike many legislators, I've actually been to, in my own career, three different kinds of private schools. I started out in a Catholic day school. I went to public school. I went to um, an Anglican church boarding school and I graduated from a private day school. And I, I can't imagine that my parents would ever have asked anybody but themselves to pay for that. Um, that was their choice, it was mine. I founded a cooperative um, preschool for my own children that then became a um, homeschool group, although we went to public school with our kids, that's what we decided to do. I believe in public education and I think vouchers will siphon off money and siphon off also some of the most motivated parents and we need everybody's voice. Like Chris was talking about community. We're all in this together and taking our, our own stuff and going home with it um, doesn't help us as a community. Oh, I'm sorry, here we go. Hello there. I like the, everything that both of you said, and I agree. Um, I really uh, want to ask you how effective it would be if uh, there were more money put into early childhood development. I had a very good early childhood in Sitka. And then after things, after that, as I grew up, things got very hard. But I found myself coming back to wanting the same life I had when I was a child. And I do believe that there should be an extra teacher there because sometimes you notice it breaks your heart if some of these very young children are tired probably hungry and depressed. I remember things like this because when I was little, I had a real outstanding family. I used to be very uh, intimidated. I used to wonder, how can I live up to them, you know, but they didn't live long enough for me to do that. <laughs> so, uh, and then the other thing is, the world is changing so fast. I like what you talked about, about your neighbors being friendly. Relaxing and uh, listening, listening around you, around you, and everybody should be included. You know, it isn't just us anymore. Thank you. Want to answer a question? No, thank you very much for the question. You know, I think one of the best investments that we can make is in the most important resource that we have coming out here in Alaska, and that's human resource. And early childhood education is very important. It sets the foundations. When I served on Alaska School District School Board, we did this exercise, exercise called ABCs, Acknowledgements, Beliefs, and Commitments. And through that, we acknowledge what our situation is. We have a belief system that we would uh, like to see happen, and then our commitments. What are we going to do? And one of the things that we learned through that is that connectivity with the child is so important. And it takes five people to raise a child whether it's two parents, grandparents, and an uncle, two parents, a teacher, a janitorial worker, a coach, whatever it takes, it takes those resources. And that's what we need to do is we need to, to continue putting resources into our local school districts. So because, because of the vastness of Alaska, because of the remote populations, because our needs are different than elsewhere, we have got to allow the local school boards to be able to know what's best and do what's best for their students in their community. Because you go out to the state of Alaska, one needs is not the same as the other people's needs. But I will say this, in the sense of community, we have learned that my issues may not be Senator Gardner's issues, but if we all stick together and work on Senator Gardner's issues, and then we all stick together and work on my issues, we're always better off. And I think that going to a voucher program is a cop-out. I think that we need to buck up, we need to rise to the occasion, we need to provide a vision for our future generations so that we do have higher expectations, if you will, raise expectations of what we want to see from education system, and that is 100% graduation. Your question actually brought to mind um, an experience I had and it, it, it feeds into what Chris is saying about community, too. Um, at Wendler Middle School, where my kids went to middle school, 
it was way overcrowded. And during the passing periods, it was just a, it was hard to stand still in the halls. It was like kids surging everywhere, and there was a certain amount of shouting and kind of elbowing and shouldering each other. And it was, it was really very interesting. And several years later, when I was a legislator, um, NEA invited or actually encouraged legislators to go and spend a whole day in a school. And I always pick middle school because I love that combination between elementary and high school. Their kids are just like everywhere across the board. And the, the hallway passing time was dramatically different. It was quiet, it was calm and orderly, and I couldn't figure out what the difference was. And I asked the teacher whose classroom I was spending the day, and she said, well, haven't you noticed every teacher during passing time stands in the doorway, not monitoring the hall, but making eye contact, greeting, and maybe touching every child who comes in the room. Say, Mike, I'm glad to see you today. How are you? To every kid that came in the room, every classroom, and the, the impact was just astonishing. So I just want to say that there are a lot of things that go into making healthy, happy, welcoming, functioning schools. It isn't all money. I mean, you can't do it if you don't have the resources you need. But some of the things don't cost anything except a plan and commitment to follow through. Good afternoon. It's really good to see folks down here uh, commuting with our native people, the native issue forms. It's good to know what's going on up on the hill, especially with our with our legislation, with our people, because it's our home state. And our kids are really important to us and our grandchildren. Our highest expectation is our grandchildren to far better their education and uh, working with that. The voucher, uh, that's one question I don't think that would ever work there. And, uh, but I'd like to see uh, through the legislation, I see on the budget, see my was that should be a number priority on the state when the legislators and senators are meeting. Yet they got that about like second and third on the list. So I think in the education was where our funding comes from with our I would say our children and our grandchildren always be expectation for our leaders. So I really commend you guys for coming down and letting us know where we're at with our uh, legislators up on the hill. And you know, that's really good for you folks to be down here. One thing I'd like to um, address, if I may, is, uh, you know, they have that nice ad, ad tech up right there in Seward. You know, I'd like to see one here in Southeast somewhere. I know we have uh, the BTRC and they do really good. Matter of fact, that in the, the 477 people just had uh, uh, some kids, young people went to that uh, dental training. My youngest one, Kalanda, was in there. And they, the kids did really good and I'm really proud of them. And uh, I think they're, you know, a lot more kids aren't so college, you know, really uh, what they get intimidated when they go so far away from home when it, not everybody's into college. I think more of um, vocational training for our, of our children. I'd like to see more of that. And, and uh, I'd like to say thank you to Ed and his staff that put on that training for it young people that did a dental work. I was really proud of all each individual over there, the parents, grandparents, and even the young ones were there to be proud of their uh, mothers and their friends. They all made it, but we really appreciate you folks being here today. Thank you. Thank you. No, I want to thank you for that. And, uh, you know, we, whether or not you have a child in the education system, we all depend on one another's children for our communities. We have, you know, f after all, if you're going to call 911, it's going to be someone's child that comes to your assistance. If you're going to go to the doctor, it's going to be someone's child that's taking care of you. And when you go to the voting booth, you're going to be electing someone's child to really plan the future of Alaska. So we're all dependent on one, and one another's children. So I really appreciate your passion and concern in making sure that we're setting those foundations properly, uh, especially for the future generations. Unfortunately, though, when school budgets shrink, 
the first things to go is, is career and technical education, which you were, you were talking so passionately about. And, you know, because it's cheaper to prepare kids for college than it is for the specialized um, skills that you need and to, to enter some of the work, um, work, in the work situations that we have here in the state of Alaska. And we have some mining going on. We have oil and gas, which is the two highest paying industries in the state of Alaska. Uh, third is construction. And a fast fourth is health care. And so we want to make sure Alaskans have the opportunities for those jobs. And we also want to make sure that the investments that we make now continue to pay off down in the future. And, and so I, I, I'm just concerned that, uh, you know, when we just only train students for higher education college, that oftentimes they leave the state of Alaska to pursue higher education, never to return back, and we lose on that investment. And then when we need someone for those high-paying jobs on the North Slope or in our mines, we're hiring them from Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, and we're not capitalizing. So, so we need to capitalize on, on growing our own here in the state of Alaska. And again, it's just getting resources back into our education system. And on the subject of vocational training in our K-12 programs, um, there actually are some programs around the state and not nearly enough, not big enough, but they are, as Chris points out, the more expensive in terms of equipment and space. If, you, if you're teaching kids to do construction, you need a shop and you, can, you can't have 32 kids in your shop at one time. You know, it's just you need more space and more resources. And so that's an impediment and also one of the first things to go. But there are... Um, centers are around. Um, Kotzebue has one. In Barrow, there's technical stuff. Um, Mount Edgecombe, there, so those kids can get a variety of certifications when they graduate. And um, in Anchorage, the King Career Center has 28 different tracks, and it's everything from beauticians to land man resource management um, and, and a bunch of other stuff. You can be, be an EMT when you get out of the King Career Center if that's what you want. And so that, that kind of program should be replicated every place we possibly can where there's demand. And, and need. <laughs> My name is Stephanie Rainwater, and I work for Economic Development for Clinton United Central Council. Uh, just recently, I have been talking with the Department of Transportation, uh, the outgoing uh, commissioner with Musil, and we had the meeting with Pat Kemp, the new commissioner. And I was surprised that we have, um, we hire people from out of state for the Alaska Marine Highway. There's 1,100 jobs on the Alaska Marine Highway, and 100 are filled every year. And in that 100, there's a certain percentage that is from out of state. And I don't believe the whole state of Alaska understands the hiring process for the Alaska Marine Highway. And I think communication throughout the state so we can keep our jobs in Alaska would be a, a wonderful thing. I would like to see the commissioner work with uh, um, uh, Inland Boatman's Union and with uh, the communities in Alaska on securing those jobs. Those jobs have a retirement system, medical, and they're good jobs in our community. Well, I'd absolutely have to agree with you. I'd like every good job here go to a qualified and ready-to-work Alaskan. And that's, I think, what we all should, should look for and bring people in from outside only when we can't fill it from home and, and figure out why we didn't fill it from home and fix that. No, thank you very much, and I think that uh, more of us need to speak up on that issue right there. Um, and it's interesting to hear the the, um, the ferry system, you know, making sure that we have Alaskans on, on those jobs. But, you know, because of Alaska's remoteness, you know, we have a lot of camp job um, occupations here in this state, whether it's fishing, construction, um, again, mining and oil and gas and, and, and our ferry terminals. And so we got to make sure that uh, we have conditions that, uh, um, that um, makes it a worker, you know, be able to work safely in these camps. And we also need to make sure that we are providing those education opportunities so Alaskans t can take advantage of those high paying jobs. You know, I know that up on the North Slope, for example, it's not really what you know as often as it is who you know. 
And, uh, you know, a lot of people are hiring their brothers and sisters and cousins and, and friends from down south rather than, than here in Alaska. And I know plenty of Alaskans that would like those opportunities but just don't know where to go to get those opportunities. You know, you go on these disconnected websites and put in an application hoping that your name will somehow rise to the top. But oftentimes it's who you know. And that's the kind of culture that we need to break and try to get into and try to make sure that Alaskans have those opportunities. I do serve on the uh, board of directors for Alaska Process Industry Careers Consortiums, and that's what we're trying to do exactly that. We're trying to partner with the big industries in the state to make sure that we have training opportunities for Alaskans. And if there's no other question, I just want to make a quick comment, just real quick on what uh, President Thomas said. And just real quick, one of the things that I see throughout history, there's always been two types of power. And that is the control of money and the control of people. Oftentimes, the control of money does take control of people, but what I'd rather say is people taking control for themselves. And he talked about the corporatism that's going on. And I think that's some of the, the, the uh, uneasiness that society is feeling these days is due to you know, some of the powers that are just being pulled away from the power of the people. And so going back to that sense of community, we all need to stick together. And a lot of it is face to face. So I appreciate you guys again coming here to uh, be with one another. Nancy's got one more announcement, one more introduction rather. We've gotten over here in the back there. I just wanted to recognize Representative Jonathan Christ Tompkins. And other, also on February 23rd, there's going to be a medical fundraiser for Mike Everson. And there, Marcelo Quinto and Donald are going to be the cooks. There's going to be halibut, Olympia, clam chowder, so it'll be really good. And then tentatively, um, on March 3rd, Sunday from 2 to 6, uh, we'll be doing the third um, All Drummers and Dancers Gathering. And if anyone's interested in uh, being, having a vendor's table, um, they can see me. And all dancers and drummers, whether you're in a dance group or not, are going to be welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. And I want to thank Nancy for all these years of helping us uh, uh, introduce our people in the legislature. Uh, I want to thank the speakers here are doing a great job in coming down here and uh, being with us and talking about uh, these very important issues. Uh, in my closing comments, I was hoping the people from the governor's office would uh, be able to hear what I have to say. Uh, I very much appreciate the discussion on education. And when we talk about declining in resources, we need to talk about those dollars coming from the state of Alaska, they're not just like in an education box over here, and that's the only place we can get money. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, earlier in the month of uh, January, I read the paper and somebody was so proud that they're going to put lights all the way on Egan Drive and uh, $4 million. $4 million doesn't seem like much in the state budget, but it does mean a lot to the school district here if we had $4 million. could do a great deal of good. Not only that, you've got to operate those lights all year. You gotta, then we've got to build a new dam just so we can keep Egan Drive uh, lit up. And what I was going to ask them to do is maybe pass the bill, ask people to turn their lights on when it gets dark. All the cars, you know, they can turn their lights on. It'd be a lot cheaper than the $4 million, and we could put some of those dollars to good work in our school system. But these kinds of thoughtless uh, pieces of legislation that come down just bother me, because we have got ourselves fooled into thinking there's no end to the money that do oh, will light up uh, Egan Drive. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to anybody to light up Egan Drive, except people that like light up Egan Drive. Because it costs money, it's not free. And uh, uh, I'm you know, going to retire in a few years, and if I have a house here, the taxes are going to go up so we can pay for electricity to light up even Egan Drive. Then we're going to put flower pots on all those lights. So, you know, that kind of thinking is really, uh, you know, I think should be over with in this state. 
that if we need something, make sure you prioritize the whole ball of wax and don't force education into a little thing because education is constitutional. It's in the Constitution. Those lights aren't. So, you know, that's just an example, you know, that we do have to cut down waste, and the governor talked about that uh, in his speech, and I heard it. And so I totally agree, but on the one hand, you say, let's uh, be frugal, but then do silly things like that. It really bothers me as a person, a taxpayer, and a person that's been around long enough that I made it out uh, back and forth on that drive, daytime, nighttime, and the only time people run off is when it's, they're driving too fast for a slippery road. That's when they run off. It doesn't matter daytime, nighttime, or whatever, any time. That's when they run off the road. And it's not because they can't see at night. Uh, but so, uh, you know, I, I can go on and on about that, but that's just one example of how we've got to be smarter when it comes to managing our people's money in the state. Thanks again for being here, and i sorry you had to listen to my little closing speech, but uh, uh, you're lucky you don't work for me. You'd have to listen to more of those. <laughs>